what is open and relational theology? Well, it's kind of a broad tent of various kinds of views of God that have some differences among them, but they share two things in common. One, they think God is relational. That is, God is really affected by what happens in our lives and in the world. God suffers with us, we might say. God is happy when we are, are uh, loving one another and sad when we're not, etc. And the other one is that open means that the future is open, not only open for us as if it's not yet settled, but also open for God. So it's uh, a lot of people think of God as sort of outside of time, seeing all history all at once. Open theists think that God experiences time moment by moment like we do. So, so friends, if you are watching and you have a comment or a question, feel free to ask them. Uh, anything goes here. Um, Tom, I, I, I was wondering what you think about this. Uh, we have been given so many answers about God. Uh, we've been taught so many things. And one of the things that we like to say in kind of more, that I used to like to say in more progressive circles is that there are no bad answers. Let's just explore God. You've got your questions. There are some people who refuse to even say question and answer and have it be question and response because we don't want to offend people by saying we have the answer, right? And I get that, but there are some bad answers, right? I I think so. I, I like to put it this way. They're better and worse answers. Uh, so I guess the worst ones are bad, but <laughs> yeah. Or maybe a, a better way to put it, at least the way I like to say it, there's some answers that are more plausible than others. And plausibility okay. involves bringing in all kinds of resources. And, and so, yeah, I, I think we want to aim for the best answers we can get. Well, I'm going to throw some questions at you. Great. And uh, some of our people uh, in the chat, you can throw some questions out too. And um, I, I haven't said this yet, but get questions and answers uh, for God Can't, because it's a fantastic book. Uh, we get questions all the time from people asking the very questions that you're talking about in this mm -hmm. book, Tom. So thank you for writing it. I highly recommend it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, first question is this whole idea about God can't, uh, mm -hmm. because we've been taught that God is all powerful and God is all knowing. And if you say that God can't do something, then clearly you are a heretic. <laughs> so, um, own up to your heretic status and just come out with it. Well, if saying God can't do some things is heretical, then there are some heretics in the Bible itself. <laughs> so um, we've often come to the Bible assuming that God could do anything. Uh, maybe some people have said God is doing everything. So they have kind of a controlling God. who We have no free will, there's no chance, and everything is determined. But most people I know come to the Bible thinking God could control and occasionally does so, maybe to stamp out a miracle here or make sure an election happens there or whatever it is. Um, but the problem with that view of God is that there's lots of things in the world that suck. Uh, uh -huh. There, There's genuine evils. There are elections that go particular ways that we think aren't for the common good. And so then what people have to do is sort of scramble who think that God, people who think that God can control, they have to scramble to come up with some kind of a justification for the evils of the world. I'm willing to say that God simply can't control anyone or anything. Not because God is totally hands off and watching us from a distance. God, I think, is involved moment by moment in absolutely everything from the most complex to the least complex. But my view is that God always loves, always loves everyone, every creature, everything, and God's love is inherently uncontrolling. And so to say God can't control others, I think, is another way of saying God's love is always uncontrolling. One of the emphases that you put in this book is exactly how you started that question, which is the Bible frequently says God can't. Right. Can you go through a, just a few uh, passages where we see this principle? Sure. The writer of Hebrews, for instance, says God can't tell a lie. Uh, Titus also says that. James says God can't be tempted. The psalmist says God can't grow tired. 
there are others. My my favorite one is because it's kind of overarching, I think, is when the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy and he says, uh, when we are faithless, God remains faithful because God cannot deny himself. And so the idea is that God has a particular nature or way of being. And if God were to not be like that, then God wouldn't be God, we might say. Now, theologians sort of fill out the details of what that looks like. And my proposal is that love comes first in God. And God's love is inherently self-giving and others empowering and therefore inherently uncontrolling. Uh I want to get Jeff in here. Jeff has a question before his question passes by. Uh, it's a great question, Jeff. Uh, he says, can you comment as to the difference between your concept of God versus the Aristotelian God, remote from and uh, involvement in events, remote from involvements in events? Yeah, sometimes people think of, or actually Aristotle uses this language, of his God being the unmoved mover. And that means that God is always acting, always influencing, whether it's controlling or just influencing, it depends on your views. But God is always influencing the, the world, but is never influenced by the world. When I say God is relational, I mean God's not only relating to us by influencing, inspiring, empowering us, but what we do actually has an effect on God. I actually think that's the normal way bib biblical writers think of God, so it's not like an unusual idea, except that, unfortunately, many, many Christian theologians followed Aristotle on this issue rather than the dominant view of God in the Bible. And so that's one of the biggest differences between my view and Aristotle's view. I, when you were here preaching, uh, well, you weren't here, but when you were preaching for us uh, at the beginning of COVID, I was reminded, and I think I mentioned this, I, would, I was reminded of Abraham Joshua Heschel when you were talking. Mm -hmm. um, and I see a lot of, it, the one of the greatest, not only rabbis of the 20th centuries, but the great one of the greatest spiritual leaders of the 20th century, Abraham Joshua Heschel, many books, huge influence in my life. And I believe it's, I believe he says somewhere in one of his books that opposed to Aristotle, who, uh, who says that God is the unmoved mover, Heschel says that in the prophets, you see that God is the most moved mover. That's exactly right. I think he's the one who coined that phrase, most moved mover. And it's been picked up in the communities that I'm a part of, the theological communities I'm a part of, open and relational theology. A guy named Clark Pinnock, who is a more conservative evangelical open theist, had a book called Most Move Mover, in which he lays out an open view of God. And he credits Heschel in that particular book. It's a really important idea, I think. Yeah, I love it. It's fantastic. How did you get interested in this whole idea of God can't? Love, baby. <laughs> love. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, like most people, have kind of been grasping it, trying to figure out something about who God is. Um, I was an avid evangelist when I was younger. I was really hardcore. Uh, then I went through a phase in which I didn't believe in God anymore. And my disbelief was based on intellectual reasons. And it was really the issues of love and meaning that brought me back to believing that there was a God. And it allowed me to have the freedom, given that my view of love is central, that God is love is central. It gave me the freedom to examine all kinds of other things I had thought about God. And in that process, I eventually became, be, uh, came to sit, think that rethinking God's power in light of love made a whole lot more sense than continuing to affirm the kind of classical omnipotence or all, almighty view of God. So what would you, do you do away with uh, God is all powerful kind of language? The word I like to use is almighty. Uh, you know, you could use sovereign, you could use omnipotent, almighty. All of these words are sort of available, but they have certain connotations for people. And usually the word sovereign and omnipotence is used in a way of a controlling kind of God. 
I've settled on using the word almighty, even though I realize it's got some baggage too. Yeah. Um, but I do it because I think God is almighty in three senses. And the word almighty itself fits these three senses. So God is almighty because God is mightier than all others. To quote the psalmist, God has no equal. Hmm. Second, God gives might to all others. God is a provider, we might say. And God exerts might upon all others. So those ways of thinking about God as being powerful, I, I, don't, I don't believe in a weak God. I know some people are drawn toward that view. My friend uh, Jack Caputo talks about a weak God. Um, I, like, I think God is strong. It's just that I think God can't control. So it's a different kind of strength than classical omnipotence. I'm curious, what, what does a weak, what does weak God mean? It depends on the person. I okay. think what uh, uh, many people who want to affirm a weak God, they're trying to compare it with a controlling God, and they don't want a God who is um, responsible for the rotten things that happen in the world. And in that sense, I'm totally on board with them. So it's really a matter of semantics. Uh, I think God really does stuff, really has power, just not the kind of controlling power that so many people have thought God has.